those they rule. If you go on destroying all your subjects, you'll soon have no one to rule. So although the husband was to rule over the wife, part of your responsibility in doing that is to protect her. And the scripture has sprinkled all through the process of how to do that, how to rule your wife by loving her, by dying for her, by sacrificing for her. You remember the situation where Zidre Hoboam, son of, son of Solomon, he took off from his dad. And uh, the people ran to him and said, be kind to us. Your father was very harsh to us. Rehoboam thought, okay, okay, I'm young. Go, I'll give you a response in two days. And he spoke to his father's counselors. What should I do? The father's counselors told him, if you want these people to serve you forever, you serve them. They'll be your servants forever. He thought, hmm, I'm the king. I serve them. Then he went to his age mates. How do you counsel me? They said to him, go tell the people my little finger is bigger than my father's waist. Go tell the people my father hit you with whips. I'm going to get with scorpions. In other words, show them who is boss. Do you know that's when the nation split into two? When the arrogance of a young king who refused to follow the advice of the older led the split of a nation into two. If you serve your wife, she will serve you. Christ serves his church. Ouch. Of course I'm talking about your neighbor. That's why your neighbor's marriage is thriving. That's why he waters that marriage. It's not dry. He waters it. He doesn't demand respect. He shows her honor. He fulfills his part of the covenant because he knows the covenant is before God. There are some evangelical feminists who have twisted this whole thing around and sought to include the last part of this verse as part of the curse. Don't go for it. And then, the wife's desire both for her husband and the need for his spiritual and physical affection and protection are rooted in the nature of her creation. This is how she's designed. Designed to receive affection, designed to be led spiritually. That does not mean that she has no ability to lead spiritually. We see examples in scripture of where Timothy was led by his mother and grandmother spiritually, and he probably had a laid-back Greek father. And when, 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 when Paul took over Timothy, though Paul calls him his son, Paul recognizes that he was a believer before he met him. And so women have a great role in nurturing faith in people. Wonderful role. And that role must be played whether or not the men are taking leadership because there's a complementary function in the relationship. It was not unusual in our home. Kids have gone to bed, and I'm going to bed, and my wife tells me, did you notice that remark that you made really hurt Michael? And I'm thinking, what remark? Then she'd remind me. And I'd be completely clueless, because I'm not designed like that. And then when that, <laughs> that happens, guess what I must do? I must put in my bathrobe and go to Michael's room and knock. Hi, Michael. Hi, Dad. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm all right. You sleepy? Not quite. I've come to apologize. For what? Remember the remark I made at the table? Yeah. It offended you, didn't I? I offended you. It's okay, Dad. No, son, it's not okay. I'm sorry. It's okay, Dad. I forgive you. Done. It's as if men have a blind spot. You know how you look in the rear view mirror of your car and look at the other mirror, and then you have to look on the side again just to see in case the car is right here? A lot of us have blind spots by design. By design. 
Wives too have blind spots. And we are supposed to complement one another in the journey along this life. Very often, we criticize each other for the blind spot of the other. How come you couldn't see that? We say that. Instead of telling, I guess, slow down, there's something you're not seeing. Together, you make a team that will really win. And God designed you that way, a helper for you. So her need to be led, her need for affection is not a result of the fall. It's rooted in the very being of how she was created. So three realities from there as well. The woman must recognize her inadequacies and in humility worship God for providing her husband. Just be very thankful to the Lord. You must not think that man, her husband's rule, is rooted in the fall and that her salvation or sanctification frees her from the need that she was created with. Remember, that need was there before the fall. The enemy has a great indoor sport game by putting the women and men in those places where they are constantly revolving around the needs not being met. Instead of thanking God for the one person he's given her to meet that need. Secondly, man must recognize that his wife has legitimate needs that can only be met in the bonds of marriage and that woman's desire to have those needs met are neither social nor selfish but rather rooted in her creation. A woman has need for conversation, doesn't she? She wants to talk all the time. I'm talking about your neighbor's wife all the time. Isn't that true? It's not a defect in manufacture. It is her design. And a woman can tell you something five, six times, and she can tell you you're not listening. And you can repeat to her exactly what she said, and she'll still know you still haven't got it. Because it's not the repetition of the words that makes you catch it. You haven't got the spirit of what I'm saying. You haven't got it. <laughs> We're supposed to go to a wedding yesterday. This is a wedding of a young man that's like a like a son to my wife, to my wife and that, a wedding of a neighbor. And uh, we've played a very active role in their lives. We even spanked the son when he was growing up because he grew up with our kids. Did they ever spank our kids? I think they did. So that's not the kind of wedding that you miss. And so we got up early in the morning, ready to go. In fact, our son was a groomsman in that wedding. But my wife wasn't feeling well. But I saw she had hung her dress. I'm going to wear that dress. And I said to her, this wedding was going to be taking place in Limuru from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. I wish it was the morning. Because her energies would run out in the afternoon. But I said to her, it's your decision. I will not be ashamed to arrive at the wedding alone. I would be ashamed to drag her to that wedding and force her to sit in it when her energies are not there. On the other hand, she would love to be at that wedding, but she's thinking, my body is not responding well. I need to lie down. So we woke up in the morning, both of us ready to go, and it wasn't until an hour to departure that she said, is it okay with you if I don't go? I said, you know what's okay with me? for you to be in good shape. If you come or don't come, so long as you're in good shape, that's what's okay with me. So she stayed behind, not because she didn't like the people in the wedding. And I went to the wedding for a short time and came back home to continue preparing for this session as I watched over her. Last night she asked me, remind me again, what time is the Nairobi Chapel thing? I said from about 9 to about 12.30 for us, but they'll stay on until after four. Says, ah, maybe I can come. I'll have enough energy to come. So when I watch over her, it doesn't embarrass me to show up without her. 
That's something you've agreed. Because her needs come first than my public image. Does that make sense? And so should yours. Your husband's needs come first before your public image. Your wife's needs come first before the, what people, what will people think? What does it matter? Hi, Marty. <laughs> it doesn't matter. What do they think? What sh- people think anything they want, isn't it? Did they even think that Christ was casting out demons by Beelzebub? People can think anything they want. What does it matter? So don't be preoccupied with what people think. Be preoccupied with what God thinks. Treat her with honor. Thirdly, the needs again are not specific in one scripture. Her needs that dispersed all over the scriptures. Very often, by the way, when I'm preaching in a wedding, I don't use the conventional um, marriage passages. I use the body of Christ passages. I use walk with God passages. Passages like like Ephesians 4, which is not talking about marriage, it says, be angry but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down when you are angry. It's a great, a great passage for marriage, but it's not classified as one of those marriage passages. But the issues in marriage are day-to-day walk with God. And so friends, if your neighbor's marriage is ailing, find out which of the two of them is not walking with God. They may both be very active in the church, or perhaps they're just ignorant of the fine print of marriage. They're just ignorant of what God requires of them because it's not in one passage. It's all over the place. Any thoughts today? No? No, okay. So on both sides of the evangelical spectrum, these needs have been distorted. We talked about the uh, feminist uh, evangelicals On the conservative side, husbands in their pride have sought to see themselves as self-existent, set themselves up as mediators and gods to their wives. They see their wives as having all the needs and weaknesses while they themselves can rule over them. My wife is the weak one. Even the Bible says she's a weak vessel. Yes, she may be weak, but your command is to treat her with honor. Just like you wash your wine glass, your delicate wine, your delicate expensive wine glass is washed more delicately than your heavy water glass, isn't it? It may be weak, but it's very expensive. The scripture says your wife, her value is far above jewels. Nothing can compare with it. So you pursue wealth and let the relationship deteriorate, God says, listen, listen, she is far worth far more than jewels. You honor me in the way you treat her, and I let you have the jewels you're pursuing, not the other way around. These husbands may rule benevolently or harshly, for the most part, with no reference to their own inadequacies. This is unbiblical. And so, so on the liberal side, Wives seek to rebel against their need to both desire and be ruled over by their husbands. They neglect those rules. They relegate those roles to the fall of man. And in pride, they have sought to see themselves as self-existent and set themselves up as co-equals with man by creation and without needs beyond those which they themselves decide and decree in and of themselves. And they say, a man, we don't need a man except to have children. And after that, we can move on in our own lives. And in so doing, shipwreck their lives. They may do so benevolently or harshly, but they're doing it contrary to how God put them together. So we are not looking for a middle line here. We're not looking for middle line. We are looking for biblical ground, not middle ground, between the radicals or the conservatives on the other side. We want biblical ground, not the middle ground. So the existence of legitimate needs of both the husband and wife are clearly established in Scripture. They should not be rebelled against by either. The husband and wife should embrace in humility their own inadequacies apart from their spouse 
and their own roles as servants in the marriage to meet the legitimate created needs which they each have. Servants in the marriage. Israel served Gibeon when Gibeon was being attacked. Gibeon served Israel on an ongoing basis. Each one bringing their strength. No one condemning the weakness of the other. That's how covenants work. So the marriage needs exist and caring for one another is biblical. In 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 34, it says, if you want to be free from concern, and I want to be free from concern, one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. The one who is married is concerned about the things of this world. That's a statement of fact. It is not saying it and therefore saying, don't do that. He's stating the facts. How they may please their wife and his interests are divided. And the woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord that, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now, friends, we see these kind of statements and we want to run away from them. These are statements of reality. Just like um, people go for... Um, Personality tests, isn't it? And uh, if you get a detailed one like the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, it can give you a lot of detail of your personality and even show you how you act or react in a crisis. But friends, those descriptions are statements of reality. It's a description. It doesn't say that is who you are doomed to be. It's a description, not a prescription. Many people have resigned to their personality. What you'd rather do is to, is to find out the weak points of your personality and grow in those areas. It is true, God accepts us as we are, but God doesn't expect us to remain as we are. And so the statements being made here are descriptive of the reality of marriage. And because the scripture says that the husband is concerned about meeting the needs of the wife, it makes that statement without finding fault with it. So go ahead and find out her needs and meet them. And wife, go ahead and find out the needs of your husband and meet them. Because the scripture says that you will be concerned about it. So being married and living like a single person is going against these realities of creation. Marrying a woman, then ignoring her with the excuse that the employer has made you very busy. The employer will always make you busy. But if employment is killing our family time, remember employment is a servant, not a master. Once it becomes a master, you're in trouble. And I know families where they are chained with golden handcuffs. They are so chained to employment and education, but the chains are so precious, they dare not remove them. You have a neighbor like that? In the meantime, their marriage is falling apart. In the meantime, their child raising is falling apart. If that neighbor is in this room, consider it again. And I'm not telling you things I've not done. I don't say that to brag. I say that to say that we are humans and these scriptures were written for humans. So don't let your humanity be excused for not doing it. <laughs> they were written for humans. What's bronze? What's it made of? Copper and, and tin. And in such a way, it's blended in such a way that once it's made, you can no longer extract the copper or the tin. It blends into a new metal. In a very similar way, the scripture says, so a husband, so a husband and wife, when they become one, it is not that the spouse 
has needs, that you must take time from your needs to meet her needs. But in meeting her needs, you're meeting your needs. You're so intermeshed, they are no longer two but one. We know bronze is two metals, but they're so intermeshed, you can't separate them. That's how God designed it. That's how he designed it. He designed it so well. Do you remember when Paul was persecuting Christians and he met the Lord? The Lord said to him, why are you killing my people? Is that what he said? No. What did he say? Why are you persecuting me? Persecuting you? I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting people who claim Christ said, that's my body. That's my body. You can't touch my body without touching me. Christ takes it very personally. We are his body. He says we are one with him. You touch the body of Christ, you're touching Christ. So the Christians couldn't defend themselves against Paul. Christ defended them. In a very similar way, we are so meshed together that we should see each other as one, as the Bible puts it. So to go on with what my lady there said, to go on joining yourself to various partners makes a mockery of what God is saying here. That is why, maybe one of the reasons why, the Lord says, you know when, the, when the, uh, he was performing miracles and the Pharisee says, oh no, he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub. That really upset him. He said, any sin against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but sin against the Holy Spirit, that will not be forgiven. They were attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil. Christ says, no, I am one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I cannot simultaneously be one with the devil. I cannot be that. That really offended him. And in the marriage covenant, the oneness that exists in the Godhead is the oneness he expects of us. As a matter of fact, he expects that oneness in Christian relationships. Read John chapter 17. The oneness he has with the Father, he expects that between brothers. But then it becomes even deeper between husband and wife. And guys, I'm dwelling on this because if that foundation is not set, and I know you'll have plenty of time for discussion this afternoon, then you'll make exceptions in situations where we ought to be growing instead of making exceptions. We ought to be growing once you understand the gravity of the covenant. In meeting your spouse's needs, you're meeting your needs. So you don't give up your needs to meet their needs. You meet your needs by meeting their needs. Malachi 2.16. I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Mark 10.9. What therefore God has put together, let no man separate. I hate divorce, God says. But did you know that under the, under the old covenant, God did divorce Israel? Did you know that? The book of Ezekiel. And then he said, a new covenant he will make. And when the Lord is about to die, about to go to the cross, and he pulled his disciples together in that last supper. He said, a new this is the new covenant. Um, let's look. I won't go into it. But in the new covenant, he sheds his blood. The blood that was symbolically shed at the foundation of the world, now he sheds it and seals that covenant. And he says, you prescribe to me, I'm going to defend you. Then he becomes our advocate. Then he becomes our redeemer. He, he is the one who is supposed to accuse us when we sin. But because we have chosen to walk with him, he's the one who defends us. Do you read Romans chapter 8? It's got very good legal language in there. Then who can separate us from the love of God as in Christ Jesus? Will famine, will this, will this? It's a very beautiful argument. The one who is supposed to separate us is the one defending us. But be careful, friends, because the Lord does warn us in Matthew, 
Is it Matthew 10? Check it out for me, City. I don't know if it's Matthew or Mark. It's, it's 10.33. I think it's Matthew. Where he says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. That would be a horrible thing to appear before the Lord God, the Father, without Christ as your advocate. Men, you are doomed. <laughs> you are doomed. You want, is it Matthew? Matthew 10, 33. You are doomed to appear before the Father without Christ as your advocate. And so on this side of life, Christ is telling us now, I'm your advocate, you walk with me. And let your marriage be an example of what that looks like. And when Paul is talking in Ephesians 5, I don't think that's in my notes, 25 to 33, he talks about the husband loving the wife, then he switches and says, Christ loving the church. And he says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each husband love their wife as their own selves and let the wife see to each who respects her husband. He, he's talking about marriage, but he quickly moves into Christ and the church and then comes back into marriage. And he, say, he calls it a deep mystery. Friends, a functional marriage is a beauty to behold. When you see husband and wife 37 years getting along. Do they offend each other? Oh, yeah, they do. We do. But listening to each other, apologizing, and building each other up, watching out for the other. Did I come in here with my cup of tea? And I left home this morning. What time did I leave home? At 5, 5.15. Went to my office to uh, uh, put some final uh, notes to my message today, and she came and joined me in the office, and she brought me my favorite tea the way she knows I like it. There's a seminar going on at the office. There's a seminar going on at the office. Th three seminars are going on, and tea is being made at the office. So it's not that I was lacking tea, but she brought me tea the way I like it. And I sipped it all, the, this, still a little bit in there still. I'll sip the last bit of it. And I didn't tell her, don't bring it, I've got tea here. I encouraged her to bring it. And I drank it. <laughs> Not because I needed extra tea, but she honored me by bringing it, and I honored her by drinking it. Oh, but I don't feel like. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> you don't feel like? Do you feel like going to meet your fiancé when it's raining? No, but you go anyway, don't you? Here's a secret. Before you are married, feelings led to action. Feelings of love led to actions of love, right? Is that true? Once you are married, actions of love will bring back feelings of love. So whereas it may be true, you don't feel like loving anymore. Whereas that may be true, it is not the end of the road. You can bring the feelings back by acting on love. Before you are married, feelings of love bring actions of love. Once you are married, actions of love bring back the feelings of love. So just go and work on it. Just do it. I don't feel like, don't worry, do it, you will feel like. And if you have a woman out there, you guys, that you feel like doing good things to, list all those things down and then do them to your wife. <laughs> yeah, just list all of them. What do you feel like doing for her? List all of those things and then do them for your wife. And the feelings will come back. I mentioned this earlier, that the scripture says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. First mention, as far as I know in scripture, of the woman taking the initiative to divorce. But it's there. And I ask you the question, I ask you the question, why does God consider it, consider it adultery? when you marry a divorced woman. 
And I already answered, I think it's because he still finds that spiritual covenant in place where God has, has, has put together, let no man separate. The courts of men separate, but God says in my books, mm -mm. Not only that, in the olden days, in the days of Moses, if you divorced your wife, you are allowed to remarry her. But if you divorced her and she married somebody else, and he divorced her, you could not take her back. It's a spiritual intermingling there that somehow does not honor God. He says you can't take her back if she's been married to somebody else. I don't understand the dynamics. But within God's spiritual uh, dimension, he says, no, don't go there now. But if you divorce her, she doesn't get married, you can remarry her. Now, the Lord says to us men, you have heard, it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, Everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Guys, how many of you know a man who has committed adultery? According to that definition. Yeah, you do. Me too. How many of you are that man? My hand is still up. All right. Knowing that all us guys are guilty of adultery, therefore, do not judge those who have been divorced and remarried, don't judge them. Let the Lord deal with that. Don't promote it, but don't judge them. Because you're equally guilty of adultery. Do not gloss over the sin of divorce and remarriage, claiming it's a very sensitive matter we can't talk about without offending people. Don't do that either. We should name it. Treat it are the sin of drunkenness, the sin of stealing. In God's eyes, there are no dignified sins. Ouch. So on the one hand, don't run into it. We are guilty of it. On the other hand, don't trivialize it because God does not. Does that make sense? Don't go around condemning. The scripture says, who are you to judge the servant of another? Before his own master, he'll stand or fall, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. 1 Corinthians 6. My wife will help me. So don't go around dispensing judgment on those who have failed God's command. Galatians 6 tells us, brothers, if any of you, this is from verse 1, is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual should help him. But as you're helping, watch to yourself, lest you to be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It goes on to say, if anyone thinks that he stands, let him be careful lest he fall. So it's a very delicate path we are walking on. And yet we can walk on it because God has made provision. So don't rush into divorce and say God's grace is available on the one hand. On the other, do not be too vocal about your neighbor or your pastor who may be struggling in their marriage. Don't be too vocal about it. Rather, be part of the solution if you can. What if you marry the wrong person? Ouch. Remember the Gibeonites? Wrong people to get a covenant with. God was not consulted in the decision of the Gibeonites. It was a bad decision. But after it was made, covenant was entered into, God got involved. As I read the scriptures, the wrong person to marry is the divorced person. Because the scripture is clear about that. But if you marry a divorced person, don't go around condemning them. You don't know their story, <laughs> okay? So don't go around condemning them. But I'm talking about you. Don't go around divorcing and marrying. If you're married to the wrong person, does Christ ever save the wrong person? The thief on the cross, he escaped by the skin of his teeth. He had no opportunity to do any good works. But he recognized this man 
This is the real deal. He's about to die. He knows that there's life after death. Lord, when you come to your kingdom, remember me. And Christ remembered him. That man's life up to that point was evil. In that last moment, he cries out to the Lord, and the Lord remembers him. Fair or unfair? Wrong question. The Lord has a right to remember. But remember, there were two thieves on the cross. We hardly ever hear sermons about the other thief, do we? The other thief was equidistant from Christ on the cross and had equal opportunity to also be saved. But instead, he hurled abuses at the Lord. Don't plan to sin, saying, in the last moment, I'll repent. That thief had a last moment. But his heart was so fouled, he did not repent. So don't count on it. Don't count on living a rebellious life and escaping like the thief on the cross. Remember, there was a second thief. And you might just be that second thief <laughs> who has the opportunity, but the heart is so hardened that you don't make the right decision. Live, ha have, have a line of sight with the Lord. Don't let there be things clouding that. You may have relational issues, but have a line of sight with the Lord. And the Lord said, if a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemy to be at peace with him. In this case, the enemy is that woman you're trying to take to court. Before you take her to court, ask yourself, do I have a line of sight with the Lord? And if there are bumps in your relationship with the Lord, sort them out. Get that log out. You might find that the wife, your wife's speck, you can actually help her to remove it. But you've got the log in your eye. You think she has a log as well. In marriage, we are responsible before the Lord for keeping the covenant. Proverbs 19.14, land and wealth are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. And you're thinking, what if she's not prudent? Work with her to become prudent. The Lord is cast in the lap, but his every decision is from the Lord. For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. He watches all his paths. You know, all of us make wrong decisions at some point. When we do, including thinking we've made the wrong decision in marriage. When we do, the solution is not always to disengage. The solution in this case, because of covenant, is to ask the Lord, what can I do to make this right? You may be surprised that this wife who makes you so angry, actually doesn't make you angry. She just reveals the anger that you've had since you were a teenager. And if you stick with her and allow me to use her to reveal that anger and deal with that anger, she is actually the mate that is suitable for you. Lord, really? Yes, son, really. Remember how angry you've been through your life? Remember how you beat up that guy in high school? Remember how you beat up your boss? Yeah, you're a terrible guy. I gave your wife suitable for you. Really, Lord? Really, yes. She's going to rub you the wrong way until you become smooth. Yeah. And then, and now, if... If your relationship is so tumultuous that it helps reveal your challenges with work with God and allows you to work on those challenges so that your work with God is perfected, will you thank God or condemn God for that partner? You have to thank him, isn't it? But see, we have to change our mind frame to come to that conclusion. When Paul had his thorn in the flesh, he called to the Lord three times, which means over and over again, take it out, Lord. Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. What does Paul say after that? Therefore, I'll rejoice in my weaknesses. He realized that this weakness I have will actually bring God's strength in me. And once he realized that, he began to rejoice. 
Those of you who thought they married the wrong person, think again. That may actually be the mate that is fit for you, that's revealing all the imperfections within you. And I dare you, note down all those things that she reveals and all those emotions that she brings up. And I dare you, begin to find out when those emotions first began to be an issue for you. And I guarantee you, they did not begin when you married her. They began way before in your growing up years. She's simply revealing them. She rubs me the wrong way, it means you have a wrong way to be rubbed. Yeah, you have a wrong way to be rubbed. So sort up to your way. So when she rubs it, it's no longer the wrong way. Did you get that? Yeah. You have a side of you that if it's rubbed, the worst of you comes out. Do you know why the worst of you comes out? Because the worst of you is inside. <laughs> the scripture says, do not be eager in your heart to be angry because anger resides in the bosom of fools. Ra anger has taken residence in your bosom and your wife keeps bringing it out. You get rid of that anger and no matter how she rubs you, it will not come out because it won't be there. Thank God for her for revealing this area of your life that needs his grace for growth. What are you hearing? <laughs> Got 12 more slides and I'll be done. What are you hearing? Yes, sir. Microphone over there. Back there, yes. What are you hearing? <laughs> Uh, thank you. I like the way you unpacked the covenant between uh, God and uh, Abraham. Mm. And uh, my neighbor was just wondering mm. whether you could also unpack the covenant between Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah? Yes, especially at the point where a third party was introduced to the marriage. Yes, yes. And uh, this is related to the legitimate needs where you've said that uh, you meet your needs by meeting the needs of your partner. Yes, yes, yes. Very interesting. There's tradition and there is covenant. There is uh, godliness. Let me talk about one other example first before I come to that because of the parallel. Remember when Becky was pregnant? Becky? Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> and she had twins, remember? And the Lord told her what? You're carrying two nations. And then he also told her, the older shall serve the younger. There is no evidence in scripture that Rebecca ever told Isaac what God told her. What we do see in scripture is when Isaac thinks he's about to die, he knows he's blind, he sends Esau, the one who was not supposed to get the blessing, to go and hunt and bring him game so he can eat, right? So he treats Esau according to what tradition requires. We do not know from scripture that Isaac was a rebellious man. We don't know that. So I'm left with the thought he didn't know. That's, that's my own conclusion, that he didn't know. So as he seeks to bless Esau, Rebecca is thinking, eh -eh, this thing is going to go the wrong way. She does something that she should not have done, but eventually Jacob gets the blessing that you're supposed to get. Jacob in his older days, when he himself is blind, is coming to Joseph's house and is about to bless Joseph's sons. And though he's blind, Joseph brings his son, firstborn, on his right side to get the hand of blessing and the secondborn here. And though Jacob is blind, he crosses his hands. And Joseph says, no, my father. This is the firstborn. And Jacob says, I know my son, I know. And keeps his hands crossed. What am I saying? That God's blessing from through Jacob ended up with the right son with no manipulation. Even though he was blind, he intuitively knew where the blessing should go. God's blessing to Jacob in the Esau Jacob situation, there was manipulation through the wife, and it ended up there. Now, in the Abraham Sarah situation, it was God's will from the creation of the world that Sarah would become the mother of 
mother of, of many nations, but that her son would be Isaac. And so the barrenness of Sarah for years was not a hindrance for God. It was not a hindrance for God. God has seen our unformed substance. And in his book, I wrote in the days of our lives before any one of them is lived out. The days of Isaac had been written in God's book before one of them could be lived out. So Sarah, though godly, has her weakness. So when Abraham keeps coming back and saying, the Lord has promised me a son, ah, Major, can I get your son? You know I'm barren. Let's go traditional. Take Hagar as your wife. And when she bears a, a son, that son will become my son. If Hagar had given birth to a daughter, the Lord says, uh oh. If Hagar had been buried, uh oh. But Hagar gave birth to a son. And for 13 good years, they thought it's the son God had promised. They mixed tradition and promise, and it backfired. And that backfiring is still with us today. When he was 100, God speaks to him, and the son came. So you have a situation where we think we can help God out. We do what's acceptable among us. There is no condemnation. We even rejoice in the product until we hear from God. Don't do that. But I can give you the opposite example of that. Jacob only wanted to marry one woman, right? Called who? Rachel. But he ends up with four women. Not because of choice, but he's pushed into that corner. Nevertheless, the four women give birth to the 12 tribes of Israel. God doesn't just bring the 12 tribes through the one woman he always wanted. Do you see the workings of God? He can work with us, or in spite of us, he would rather work with us. So when you know the right thing to do, you do it. You don't take the Jacob, Rachel, Leah situation and say, let me have my Leah and my concubines. Perhaps God might bless it. No, you don't do that. There are certain things that must happen, like the betrayal of Christ had to happen. Christ had to die for our sins but we cannot congratulate Judas for doing it. We cannot. He did the wrong thing, but a good thing came out of it. My perspective on, uh, you know Bathsheba? She's the mother of who? Solomon and who? Who is the other one through whom the genealogy comes? Nathan. When you read the genealogy of Christ in the New Testament, one of the, all of them go back to David. One through Solomon, one through Nathan. Both are sons of Bathsheba. Did David do right to kill Uriah and take his wife? God said he did the wrong thing. My conviction is that if David had walked with God, Uriah might have died naturally in war. <laughs> And given the setting at that point, he could have married that wife legitimately. So there are th things that we do to force something and it dishonors God. That situation dishonors God. And the Abraham, Hagar, uh, Sarah situation, the dishonoring continues to date. The fights that you have in the Middle East are basically between the two sons, the sons of the two sons. Having said that, all of that, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. We have a situation in the book of 1 Samuel where Samuel has led Israel very, very well, and now he's old. And he appoints his sons to lead Israel, but the sons are corrupt. So the elders come to Samuel and say, listen, your sons don't walk with God. Find us a king. Remember that situation? And Samuel thinks they have rejected him. And he goes before the Lord. They have rejected me. And the Lord says, no, they haven't rejected you. They have rejected me. Nevertheless, give them a king. How did Samuel find Saul to be their king? How did he physically find him? God connected them, didn't he? 
It is God who picked Saul and got Samuel to anoint him. The Israelites did not contribute to that. But after picking Saul, after the Israelites stubbornly asked for a king, he told, he told Israel, he is the king you have chosen. God can work with us in difficult situations, but just because he is responding to you does not always mean he's happy with you. And so Samuel comes and tells the Israelites, you've done a horrible thing by asking for a king. And let me demonstrate to you how horrible it is, Samuel tells them. This is all in 1 Samuel 12. He says, Isn't it wheat harvest? I'm going to call upon the Lord and rain will come down. Then you will know that you have sinned against God. And he calls upon the Lord. And in the middle of the wheat season, rain comes down. So they begin to cry out, we have sinned, we have sinned. Pray for us. Here's what Samuel tells them in verse 20. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. Even though you have committed this evil, do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn aside after worthless things that cannot profit you or deliver you, for they are empty. Indeed, for the sake of his great name, the Lord will not abandon his people because he's pleased to make you his own. In other words, even though you're in this horrible state of asking for a king, now that you are here, guys, walk with God. And there may be some of you here and you're listening to me and says, Mukoli, you're condemning me for my divorce. No, I'm not condemning you. I'm telling you, now that you're in this horrible place, walk with God. <laughs> That's God's counsel. It is true you've done all this evil, but now don't abandon God. Walk with God. So God is not forever pointing fingers and forever pointing fingers and forever pointing fingers. He's saying it's not a good place you are at, but now rise up and walk with me. And our God is so forgiving. So forgiving. On the one hand, divorce is not the unforgivable sin. On the other hand, God hates it. Don't rush into it. Rather, rush into finding out how you can lift up your covenant partner. Because that's how covenant people are supposed to live. What if you have a husband, a wife, a husband who doesn't walk with the Lord? In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husband, so that even if, even if they're disobedient to the Lord, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your case and respectful behavior. Before COVID, we greet like this. During COVID, we greet like this, isn't it? And when you go like this, the other person responds to you with a fist, isn't it? In a sense, you are responded to the way you present yourself. Whereas your wife has a myriad of faults and you only think you have two faults, change your two and begin to walk with the Lord in the area of your two faults and see yourself presenting yourself differently to this wife who in your estimation has a hundred faults and see how she responds differently to you. And ladies, you have a disobedient husband, don't scandalize him to the church. Don't scandalize him. You may have one of two or three that you pray with, but don't scandalize him. Your marriage is struggling, yes. Don't be anxious, pray. And you know, we memorize these verses, but when it comes to specific situations, we don't want to apply them. We apply them in many, many areas, but this one situation, sorry, I can't, that Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is not a marriage verse. Who said so? It's a walk with God verse, and marriage, functional marriage, is all about walk with God. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That prayer list that consists of the fault of your wife, let those requests be made known to God. And then remember, that you may be seeing it badly because of the log in your eye. When you've got a log, you don't see clearly. So ask the Lord, if this be the spouse that is suitable for me, what areas in my life does she reveal that I need to work on? The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 5.25, which we know, husbands love your wife just as Christ loved the church. 
the commitment of Christ to our salvation is not dependent upon our actions. The commitment of a husband to love his wife must rise above the actions of his wife. It is true it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Jesus Christ fulfills his side of the new covenant of our salvation without reference to our actions. So we must love our wives with no reference to her action. It is not, if you respect me, I will love you. That's not covenant. If you hadn't deceived me, Gibeonites, I would protect you. No, I know you deceived me. I'll protect you anyway. That's covenant. It is not 50-50 contribution. It's each part playing 100%. The word of God speaks here directly to the husband in terms of his relationship with God. Love your wife as you love God. So when you are finding trouble in your earthly relationships, and especially in the marriage, the diagnosis should not be at the relationship level. The diagnosis should be between you and God. What's going on, Lord? What's going on? That's, what, that's how you diagnose. If you don't believe me, James 4, from verse 1 to 3. It's not in my notes, but it says, what is causing quarrels and fights among you? The question is asked, then it is answered. Don't they come from uh, desires that wage war within you? In other words, when a person has war within, they'll have relational issues around them. So every time you see a relational issue, first look within. What war is going on within me that's being revealed by this relational impasse? And sort out that relational issue, and the relational impasse will be sorted out. If the wife does not fulfill her part in the marriage covenant, the husband is still accountable to God to love his wife as Christ loved the church. The fine print for wives be subject your own husbands to the Lord. Our commitment to subjection to Christ must not be dependent upon our circumstances. The commitment of a wife to her husband must rise above the actions of her husband. It's true, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Christ expects us to fulfill our side of the new covenant in subjection to Christ without reference to our circumstances. And of course, the question will come to that question of difficult circumstances. The word of God speaks directly to the wife in terms of our relationship. God's faithfulness to his covenant then is our example in our commitment to the covenant of marriage. Paul says, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it's only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. What I'm saying is this, the law, which came 400 years and 30 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. The Holy Spirit makes a, a point here that if men do not set aside a covenant, God suddenly will not. It's a very sad testimony, I mentioned this earlier, to Christians when they dissolve their marriage, that they hire lawyers to protect their interests in other legal covenants that they have made, such as housing, car, furniture, property. If you are conscientious enough to protect those things, why aren't you conscientious enough to protect the covenant of marriage itself? Why do we have to hire somebody to fight for our rights to protect our property when we could have hired somebody to teach us how to keep the covenant? This does not honor the Lord, and especially when you go to non-believers to sort out our covenant issues. It doesn't honor the Lord. And so when disciples saw this, they were just thinking, oh my goodness. You see, if we remain faith faithless in this covenant, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. God keeps his side. And uh, the disciples said, ah, it is better not to marry. In concluding, let me say, we have entered into marriage into a high and holy covenant with God. In doing so, we became accountable to God for vows concerning the needs of our spouse, 
for which they were created to be met in the marriage covenant. It's our responsibility to master the covenant responsibilities and apply them without reference to the action of the spouse. In the covenant of marriage, we must ask ourselves, if I do not meet these needs in my covenant partner, who do I want to meet them? Trapping your spouse in a distasteful, violent marriage because of their devotion to God, knowing she will not leave you, will not go unnoticed by the Lord. Remember, she's God's daughter. Teaching your spouse to meet legitimate needs outside of, the, of, of, of marriage is not God's will. It is spiritually unhealthy and will lead to the decay of the marriage. And God will hold you responsible. If you decide that you are not responsible for meeting those needs and therefore neglect or abandon the spouse of your covenant, God will hold you responsible just like he held Israel responsible for Saul's action against the Gibeonites. If you are unwilling to respond to the responsibilities of your vows, to the covenant you have made with God, who do you want to take your place? And remember, when you send her away, you have done something physically acceptable in man's eyes, but the covenant remains in God's eyes. If you are here and you are single, you don't have to marry. <laughs> you don't have to. But if you do marry, even though you may write your own vows, the vows are being made under the covenant of God. Go research very, very deeply what the fine print is that you are signing on. The uh, book of Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Galatians are full of the fine prints pleated all over the place. The Gospels also have them. Master these books. And play your part in fulfilling the covenant. And see the Lord use you for his glory. The Lord bless you.